So this month, we are studying the book of First Thessalonians. I want to read you, this is our third, or actually it's our second week in the series, but we're on the third chapter, and so I'm going to read you a section of that chapter, and then tell you a story, and then finally come back and explain to you what it all has to do with each other. So just stick with me as I read to you these verses from First Thessalonians chapter 3. It says, therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we decided to be left alone in Athens, and we sent Timothy, our brother and co-worker for God, in proclaiming the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you for the sake of your faith, so that no one would be shaken by these persecutions. Indeed, you yourselves know that this is what we are destined for. In fact, when we were with you, we told you beforehand that we were to suffer persecution, so it turned out, as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that somehow the tempter had tempted you and that our labor had been in vain. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love. Rachel Kelsey and Jeremy Colenzo were on the side of a mountain in Switzerland They had set out that morning on what was supposed to be a day hike, 18 hours up and back. They had made it to the top of the mountain. They fixed their pitons in the stone, and they started rappelling down the side of the mountain. For weeks, there had been no bad weather, no forecast of bad weather. But that day, halfway down the mountain, a storm moved in. There was lightning, and it made their headlamps flash on and off. And not only was there lightning, there was snow, a lot of snow. Within a short amount of time, there was a foot and a half of snow on the ground below them, and they couldn't even see where to secure their ropes to make it down the rest of the mountain. They looked for some kind of shelter. All they could find was a rock. It was about a foot and a half wide and about three feet tall. They didn't have a tent because they weren't planning to spend the night. All they had was a tent-like piece of fabric that they stretched over the rock and tried to make a shelter to wait out the storm. And so they waited. And the late afternoon and evening turned into night, and the temperature began to fall and finally hit a low of five degrees above zero. As night was starting to turn to dawn, the storm had not let up, and they realized that they were not going to be able to get off the mountain on their own. They were going to have to seek help. And so Rachel pulled out her cell phone. It had one bar of service. And so she dialed the number of emergency rescue and she got that thing where it starts to make the call and then it says call cannot be completed. But she still got a little bit of cell phone service and so she decides to try something different. If If a call won't go through, maybe a text message would. And so she drafts a text message and she looks up the number of five of her friends who, because she's not from Switzerland, her friends are in London. She looks up the numbers of five of them and she sends this text message to them at about five in the morning. Need heavy rescue on North Ridge of Pease Bedeal, Switzerland. And then she waits. Four hours she waits until one of her friends, Avery, wakes up, looks at his phone, sees this text message, and immediately replies to her, I'm on the case. What that meant was that as soon as he replied back to Rachel, he got on the internet and found the phone number for the police station in um, Geneva, Switzerland. And he called the police station in Geneva and explained the situation and asked them to contact Mountain Rescue. They said they would, and Avery texts back to Rachel, help is on the way. Mountain Rescue launches a helicopter. They begin to search. It's now afternoon of the the second day on the mountain. They're searching. The afternoon starts to get to the late afternoon. Darkness is coming, but finally they locate Rachel and her friend Jeremy on the side of the mountain. But the storm is still fairly intense, and particularly the winds are fairly intense. And so the next text message that Rachel gets is one actually from a crew member on the helicopter. It says, have located you, conditions too bad to approach. And then another one quickly after, so sorry, Rachel, we tried. Wind so strong, have to wait till morning, take care, be strong. 
Rachel and Jeremy spend one more night out on the rock and sheltering next to this boulder. In the morning, the wind begins to clear. The helicopter is able to come in. It can't land, but it lowers something down and lifts them to safety. Through those two nights on the mountain that they had not expected to get through, one of the things that kept them going was text messages, something that gave them some confidence and let them know that they had support and that gave them some hope. Tonight, we're going to look to the third chapter of First Thessalonians. See, I said all this would come back. We're going to look to that chapter for some resources that God gives us. We're going to look for a message in the text. See how I did that? We're going to look for the text message in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 for resources that God gives us to keep us going when we're in the midst of struggles. 1 Thessalonians, who came up even with a crazy name like that? Let me give you a little bit of background. There is a town, it's, it's a real town in Greece called Thessalonica or Thessaloniki. And this person, Paul, he was a follower of Jesus. He went around the known world of that time planting churches, communities of faith, believers in Christ. And he had planted one in Thessalonica or Thessaloniki. But then he had to leave. He, this is in the north of Greece. He had to go to the south in Athens and he's experiencing a struggle. He has left this community, this congregation, these people that he care about who are new in the faith. And because Christianity is not by any means a dominant religion, it's hard to be a Christian. They face persecutions when they're there in, in, as a minority in, in Thessaloniki. And so he's worried about them and he's struggling and looking for some sort of encouragement. At the same time, the, the congregation, the community in Thessalonica, they're having struggles as well. When Paul initially came to them, they were so excited because Paul said, God has taken human form and people killed him, but he came back to life. He returned to heaven, but he's coming back and we have every reason to expect he will be back soon. And so let's form a community and get ready. And so they formed this community and, and they got ready. They structured their lives around people who were expectant not to be around earth much longer. But time passed. In fact, 15, 20 years passed and Jesus still had not come back. And not only that, some of the people who had formed this community who were so excited about Jesus coming back, some of them uh, were elderly and they had died and passed away. And so this community is struggling is the faith that they put out there, was it in something that really exists? Should we continue living this life of self-sacrifice and of persecution? They're struggling. So Paul sends his traveling partner, Timothy, to go check on them. Timothy goes, checks on them. He brings a report back to Paul. And Paul then writes a letter. That letter becomes 1 Thessalonians in our Bible. And in it, in chapter 3, he shares the things that have kept him going and also some of the things that he wants to encourage the church in Thessalonica that will keep them going. There are three things that I want to highlight out of that scripture that I read a little bit earlier that can be resources for us as well to keep us going when there are struggles. Paul, in his letter, he writes to them, and he says, I was afraid that you had given up your faith, but Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love. What I think he's trying to say here is that one of the things that keeps him going is the faith of these other people. Now, I know a little bit about the power of someone else's faith to keep me going. I've got a picture from an Access Worship service earlier I think it was this year, uh, might have been the end of last year, when we were studying prayer. And if you were here that night, we came and lined up around these rails and we laid a hand on each other's shoulders and we said a prayer for one another. That particular night, it was a prayer for healing. The prayers of other people are powerful. And particularly when there's something that we've been praying about it is really encouraging to have other people's prayers added to ours. A number of years ago, 
my wife went to a routine medical checkup and they found something that didn't look good. And they were concerned that it was cancer. And they were going to have to operate and remove it to check to see if it was. And this discovery immediately led us to a time of very intense prayer. And our friends were calling and saying, we want to be praying too. What can we pray for? And I asked them if they would pray the prayer that my faith wasn't strong enough to pray. It was a prayer that Jesus had prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane shortly before he was arrested, knowing that that would lead to his crucifixion. It was part of what has become the Lord's Prayer that he taught his disciples to pray. It was the prayer that God's will be done rather than mine. In that time, I did not have a faith that was strong enough to pray that God's will be done because all I could pray is that things would be okay. And so as my friends asked what they could pray for, I said, this is a prayer that needs to be prayed, but I don't have the faith to pray it. Will you pray for me that God's will be done? And because of that, as a community, our faith, not only did it keep me going, but it ensured that the full range of prayers were prayed to God. Not only the prayers that everything that would be okay Okay, but also the prayers, the true prayer of faith that God's will be done, not mine. Thankfully, after the surgery, it, it turned out that it was not cancer and, and, and things were well, but it was those prayers and the faith of others that kept me going. So Paul, as he's writing to this church in, in Thessalonica, he says, your faith is good news to me. God has blessed us as God had blessed Paul with a community where when things are, when there are struggles, we don't have to depend solely upon our own faith. We have a community and can lean on others' faith that sometimes can inspire us, sometimes can comfort us, sometimes is just what we simply need to sustain us until we get through the struggles. Paul goes on to talk about another source of strength that will keep the Thessalonians going as they go through these struggles. He writes that we sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage you for the sake of your faith so that no one would be shaken by these persecutions. So he knows that they're facing struggles, these persecutions, but then he says something that seems a little odd. And in fact, I'm going to suggest is a source of strength and something that keeps people going in times of struggle. He says, you yourselves know that persecutions is what we are destined for. Now that seems a little odd and it certainly seems not that it would be a source of strength in times of struggle. But this came home for me last year in March. We have a picture of three women who are from Pakistan. They are in tears because they are part of a Christian church in Pakistan that in March of last year, there were two churches actually that were attacked by suicide bombers. We were aware of it here, but it took particular emphasis because within First United Methodist Church Richardson, we have Christians from Pakistan that are part of our congregation. And they knew this city and they knew this church and there may have even been some in our congregation that knew people who could have been at that church. And so we were talking and praying, and in the midst of doing so, it, it came out as they were trying to teach me about the experience of being a Christian in Pakistan, that if you are going to be a Christian, you are going to be persecuted. It is not easy to be a Christian in Pakistan. Now, thank God, most of the time, the persecution doesn't rise to the level of suicide bombers, but it might. And all of the time, it is not easy. But as we were talking, it came up that sometimes these persecutions actually become a source of strength. The struggle itself becomes the means and the tools and the encouragement for, for keeping going. Because what they said was that the reason we're facing these struggles and these persecutions is because we have chosen to follow Jesus. We have chosen to be Christians and to be people that follow the Jesus that 
comes with it self-sacrifice and comes with it persecutions. When we are persecuted, it is bad, but it is also a reminder that we are being who we are called to be by God. Now, none of us are likely to face the kind of persecutions that a Christian in Pakistan or in other parts of the world might face, but I'm going to ask, I want to take a little poll to see if anybody else has experienced this. And so if this describes you, please just raise your hand and then we can kind of look around and get a sense for how common or uncommon this experience is. If you have ever faced a struggle feeling that you don't have enough, either time or money, would you raise your hand? So... Look around, that's somewhere about 100%. Uh, now, the second question, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I don't know, the number may also be close to 100%. Have you ever, has it ever occurred to you, if that you weren't here at church on Sundays and giving your money to support the ministries of the church, that you would have more time and money? Okay, you don't have to raise your hand, but it has occurred to me. But yet you do it. You give your time and you give your money because it is a reflection of who you are. You have chosen to call yourself Christian. You have chosen to tie yourself to this this Christ that we call Jesus who calls us to a life of self-sacrifice, who calls us to live a life and to make decisions that are different than other people, to give of our time and to give of our money for the sake of others and for the sake of knowing more deeply and following more fully this Jesus Christ. When we face these struggles, particularly of time and money, I hope that you will remember that part of those struggles are because you have chosen to live differently than much of the culture around you. And the fact that you face those struggles is a reminder of who you have chosen to be and the call that you have chosen to respond to from God. Paul says to these Thessalonians that they knew when they went into it that they were destined for persecutions. And the implication is now that they are experiencing them, they can be a source of strength to carry them through because the very fact that they are facing struggles is a reminder that they have chosen to follow Christ and to live differently than the people around them. Paul has one more piece of encouragement or a source of of things to keep us going when we're struggling. And it's actually part of the, the same section of scripture that I read you at the beginning where he talked about their faith and love being good news. He says, Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love. I focused earlier on the faith and said the faith of others can be a source of strength, something to get us through when we're facing struggles. Love is also something that can do it. Now, I've told some of you this before. When the word love is used in the New Testament, it, uh, it's translating a Greek word. And the Greek word that's used in the New Testament, every time it shows up, is not the one that we typically think of. It is not the word that means good feelings. It is the word that means good actions. And so when Paul writes to say that their faith and their love has been good news to him, he's saying that love piece is saying that they are caring for others. They are engaged in service. They are doing good things for the sake of other people and that that is a source of encouragement and a source of things that that will keep them going through the struggles. Some of you were with us a few weeks ago. We've got a photo from Heritage Farmstead in Plano, Heritage Farmstead Museum. We brought together faith and love that day. We went as a congregation out there and there was a time for enjoying the exhibits and seeing the animals and having fun. And then we went to do something for others. We picked up paintbrushes and wheelbarrows full of mulch and, and we washed windows. A couple of our congregation members there doing it. We did something for the sake of others. And at the end of the afternoon, the access team led a worship service in the barn. And there was the faith piece and there was the service piece. And I think I speak for everyone that was there. It was great and it was encouraging and it was uplifting and it was all of these things. 
And we might think, well, that's fine and good, Rich, when things are going well and we have time and energy to go do things for others. But when I'm struggling, in fact, we might not say it to Rich, we might say it to God, God, how can you call me to help others when I'm struggling? Because when I'm struggling, I'm the one that needs the help. How can you put, God, this extra obligation on me when I'm the one struggling? Through experience, I have come to believe that God intends this call to love or to serve or, or to do things for the sake of others, not as an obligation, but as a gift. I suspect that God knows my tendency when I am struggling to feel overwhelmed by the things that are facing me until I begin to pay attention and notice the struggles of others and mine suddenly take on a more proper perspective. I suspect that God knows my tendency to look at the struggles I'm facing and to think, God, I am powerless against these until I turn to God and God pushes me out to care for others and I see in helping others the power that I really do have. I think God uses this call to serve others even when we are struggling as a means to give us encouragement. We have a lot of parents in our congregation here at this church and parenting in the best of times is a challenge. We have parents in the Access congregation and the first UMC Richardson congregation as a whole who have had even struggles above and beyond the normal parenting struggles. I've talked to a number of members of our congregation whose children suffer from addiction. I've talked to a number of members of our congregation whose children somewhere through their childhood were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and suddenly the life in the present and the life for the future is going to have to be radically different and they and their children are going to have to figure out how to do it. I've talked with members of our congregation who have had children die. What I have seen in all three of those instances are parents who have chosen in the midst of their own struggles, to reach out and connect with other parents who may be going through the same thing. And on the surface, in terms of logic and these kinds of things, you might think, well, what do you get when you put two struggling people together? You just get two struggles that are twice as big as before. But that's not the logic of God or the logic of spirituality. What I see actually happen is when two people facing similar struggles come together, they become a resource to each other. And knowing simply that they're not alone gives them a strength and they draw on each other's experiences and, and they mourn together the future that they imagine that they're not experiencing. And they do all of these things together and what happens is both sets find that they can move forward and carry through the struggles that they're facing. God calls us even in the midst of our own struggles to reach out and care for others because I think God knows that when we do, we can experience the strength and encouragement to carry on ourselves. I've talked about three different kinds of encouragement and things that keep us going when we struggle, the faith of others, the persecutions themselves when they remind us of who we are, and then also this, this call to love and to serve. Tonight, I wanna close our sermon time by practicing one of those, by leveraging the faith of others in this room to keep us going through our struggles. And because this is a series called Text Message, we're going to do it with text messaging. In your Connect card, there's a line that says text in prayers, and there's a phone number there. That phone number is connected to both Julie's and my phone, and what I wanna ask you to do is if you have a struggle, something that you would like us as a community to pray about, pray it to that number. Julie and I are going to be up here. We are gonna read those prayers aloud. And as you hear the prayers, I ask you silently to say a prayer also for these, these things that we're naming. So in this way, we as a community will pray for each other and draw strength from each other's faith. So let me uh, open with a time of prayer and please continue to text in your prayers and Julie and I will read those as they come in. God, we thank you for the blessing of this congregation. 
for the blessing of this community of faith where it is not just our faith that has to carry us through, but that we have friends and other followers of you whose strength we can draw upon. God, we come tonight at this time to pray as a community for the prayers of our community. God, we pray this evening for, for a loved one who has passed and for the grief we feel in that. Lord, we pray that you might grant patience where it is needed. God, we pray for a teen struggling with depression. Lord, we pray for a heart for you during an uncertain and fearful time. God, we pray for a brother and the struggles that come with that relationship. God, we pray for a healthy pregnancy for a friend. God, we pray for an uncle who's been hospitalized. Lord, we pray for a brother and the unfortunate actions that he's taken. God, we pray for the sadness and the grief that, grief that comes through death. Lord, we pray for mental health, healing, and the lifting of depression and anxiety. God, we pray for a cousin in the Air Force. We pray for a father and the depression he's facing as his wife has passed away. God, we pray for strength with a new job and for language barriers that can be broken to reach more people. We pray for a child and for a loving and supported marriage. God, we pray for help and helping to understand others. We pray for a man struggling with drugs and recovering from the decisions he's made. God, we pray for our friends who are struggling with fertility. We pray for more understanding of others. God, we pray for a mom to get through the struggle of a small money to pay for a lawyer to be with her. Lord, we pray for job opportunities and patience in waiting for them to come. God, we pray for a child hurting through divorce. For a grandmother losing her sight. For a brother's marriage on the cusp of collapsing. For a mom waiting on biopsy results. Lord, we pray for a child hurting through divorce. Lord, we lift these prayers to you and all of the others that have been sent to us, the ones that we've not had time to get to, the ones that are still in people's hearts. We know that you know them all. And God, as a community, we lift our prayers to you that your presence would be felt and known in each of these situations and that we each would draw strength to get us through these struggles, through the faith of others in our community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.